Hey everyone, it's Eugene here and welcome to Forensics Talks. This is going to be episode 83 and my guest today is Dr. Rachel Turo and we're going to be speaking about veterinary forensics. Now before we begin, uh, as always, I'd like to just say, hey, if you can put in the chat window, there is a chat window usually on LinkedIn or YouTube or whatever. So it's a live chat as we're speaking. You can put in comments or if you have questions, go ahead and put those in and uh, we'll do our best to get to them. I, we've got a lot of talk a uh, lot to talk about today, so um, I'll do my best to get those in there. Uh, also, don't forget that you can always listen to Forensics Talks on your favorite podcast platform. So uh, when we're done here uh, with the talk, usually within 24 hours or so, I try to turn it around and get it up on Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, or whatever, just to kind of uh, uh, let people listen while they're driving or whatever else. So if you can, uh, make sure that you uh, get there and listen as well. Also, I don't ask this uh, very often because uh, I think it, it, people know the, the drill here. But um, if you can, uh, or if you're interested in these forensics talks, uh, just go ahead and you know where to hit the button on YouTube or also on uh, the podcasting service. You can leave a review and stuff like that. So please do that as well. Uh, um, that'd be helpful and just help to spread uh, the word about uh, the forensics talks program here. So that's all I have. Um, and we are going to get started right away because, like I said, there's just uh, plenty to talk about. So um, I want to start off uh, before uh, I talk about uh, Dr. Turu, uh, just as a little bit of an introduction. And uh, we're going to be talking about, obviously, animals and, and things like that. And the relationship between humans and animals goes back thousands of years. And throughout history, you know, animals have played a significant role in our lives from providing uh, food and clothing to you know, companionship, entertainment, and animals have been essential to our survival and well-being. So you know, taking care of animals and protecting them is essential for several reasons. And first and foremost, it's our moral obligation as humans to treat animals with respect and kindness. Uh, animals are sentient beings. They feel pain, fear, happiness, just like we do. And we have a responsibility to ensure that they're not subjected to any unnecessary suffering. So in addition to our moral obligation, you know, protecting animals also protects us in or benefits us in several ways. Animals provide us with food, medicine, and other essential resources. They play a crucial role in maintaining the ecological balance of our planet. And, you know, even though we're going to be talking today about maybe animals that are closer to us in terms of, you know, like, uh, like pets, you know, like dogs and cats and things like that. If you think about the fine balance of something like bees and what would happen if, you know, the bees disappeared or whatever, um, it would be an absolute disaster. So without animals, uh, you know, our ecosystems would collapse and it could lead to a domino effect. So we need to be careful and we need to take care of the animals on this planet. Um, but I think even more importantly, uh, or just as important, are that animals provide us with emotional support and companionship. Um, many people form deep bonds with their pets and it helps them to reduce stress, anxiety, and loneliness. So animals play a critical role in therapy and rehabilitation programs, um, helping people overcome physical and emotional challenges. So, uh, but our society has evolved. And so as our treatment of animals uh, has evolved as well, many animals are now subjected to cruel and inhumane treatment, often for the sake of, of profit or entertainment. And so the mistreatment not only harms the animals, but it has a negative impact on our society as a whole. And that's what we're gonna be talking about today. Um, just before I get started, I do want to announce that the um, I've been wanting to do this topic for some time now, and um, I'm, I'm really happy that I'm you know, glad that uh, Rachel is here at this time. And it's sort of timely as well, because April 1st is kicking off um, Prevention of Cruelty to Animals Month, and April 8th is National Dogfighting Awareness Day. So uh, it's, it's, uh, the talk is happening at the right time. 
So let me introduce the speaker, and that is Dr. Rachel Turo, and she joined the ASPCA in 2012 as the director of its veterinary forensics program, and she's currently the senior director of veterinary forensic sciences. Um, Dr. Turo oversees the ASPCA um, Veterinary Forensic Science Center, assists law enforcement with suspected animal cruelty cases throughout the United States, develops and carries out research in the area of veterinary forensics, and she teaches veterinary forensic medicine at, for the uh, University of Florida, uh, College of Veterinary Medicine, and Veterinary Medical Legal, Medical Legal Investigations for Florida International University, where she holds a, uh, a courtesy faculty appointments. Uh, she's assisted with hundreds of animal cruelty cases throughout the U.S., and she's been qualified as an expert witness on dozens of occasions in a variety of states as well as in federal court. She's a past president of the International Veterinary Forensic Sciences Association, a member of the ASB Crime Scene Investigation Consensus Body, and she's also an active affiliate member of the uh, OSAC, uh, Organizational uh, Organization of Scientific Area Committees for Forensic Science. And she's part of other things as well. Uh, she lectures at national conferences. She's doing a lot of teaching. There's a lot there to her background, and uh, we're going to be discussing this with her. So let me bring her in here. Hey, Rachel, there you are. How are you? Good. How are you? I'm great. Thanks so much for being here. I'm really glad uh, we finally got to work this out. Um, oh, I should say thank you to Alyssa as well. She's been real super helpful <laughs> in organizing it. So Alyssa, if you're out there, thanks. Thanks a bunch for making this happen. Um, I want to start by going back in time and uh and, and for example you know when when i was when i was a kid um, I, I had a farm up until i was about 12 and it, it wasn't animals it was uh, just like crops and things like that but we also had a creek when i was a kid too and uh, animals played just a, a a large part of my life as a child and um and i had all kinds of animals as pets so i had snakes i had turtles i had bats i had I had pigeons, I had um, rabbits, I had, so I had all kinds of stuff. And so they were very important to me, uh, even to the point where I was considering be becoming like a, a veterinary doctor uh, at, at one point. And so, um, yeah, I mean, like I had a best friend as a kid and that's what we did. We just, you know, animals or whatever. So Ron, if you're out there, you know exactly what I'm talking about. But I'm curious about you and you know, did you have, uh, like, was it something that was just ingrained in you from, from a child? You just had a passion for animals or was this something that happened later on? How did, how did that come about for you? Yeah, I grew up with a, a strong passion for animals. I begged my parents for dogs, cats. We had guinea pigs, birds, all kinds of pets growing up. And then later in my teen years, we had horses. So I grew up um, on a horse farm and showed horses all over the United States. And I really thought going into vet school that I was going to be an equine theory genologist and breed horses. And then, you know, life takes a turn and I realized that I was better suited in, in animal welfare. Okay, cool. And so um, was this at, at like what point of your life? Was this already when you were sort of uh, in, in, in high school and in, in university? When, when did that No, at out? university. So when I was in vet school, it just became apparent to me prior to vet school, I did a lot of research in animal welfare. Um, and I really missed that once I got into vet school. I really wanted to focus on animal welfare and making an impact for animals. Okay. So did you start working um, where did you start working? Like once you graduated, what was your, yeah, your first I, role? I was in private practice. So I really wanted to go into equine practice, but I lived in the city and realized that if I wanted to um, work on horses, it was going to be quite a commute in and out of the city every day. So I ended up doing small animal medicine and I, I learned a lot, but I did really miss that animal welfare piece. So after a year of private practice, I ended up applying for a job with the Department of Agriculture in Virginia. And because it was advertised as this animal welfare position, but that's really what kind of catapulted me into the veterinary forensic field that I am now in. Okay. And then after that, uh, so ASPCA, you started in 2012? 2012, yep. So I was with the Department of Agriculture in Virginia for about four years. And I was actually working a case with them, um, with a federal uh, entity, it was a dog fighting case, and they had called in the ASPCA to do behavioral evaluation on the dogs. 
And that, unbeknownst to me, was a working interview with the ASPCA. And shortly after that case, they offered me a, a position with them to do the work nationally. And I, I couldn't turn down that offer. So I ended up yeah. taking a position with the ASPCA. Okay, got it. And has your role changed with the ASPCA has, has, since you started? It's grown immensely. When I first started, it was just myself and one crime scene analyst. And we were running all over the country assisting law enforcement with cases. And now we have a team of people. It's just amazing how it's grown. So I oversee four, three veterinarians. I'm the fourth veterinarian at our facility. We now have two crime scene analysts who come from the human, human world to now do animal crime scenes. And then we also have a, a veterinary forensic technician. So instead of just the two of us, we now have a team of, of seven, including myself. Oh, excellent. Um, I wanted to ask, or at least talk about the, like sort of set the stage here for what we're going to talk about, which is the problem, right? And so, you know, we're talking about animal cruelty. We're talking about different aspects. And this is not about, you know, you look over your neighbor's yard and you're like, huh, you know, he's not, not feeding him that you know, the right brand of food or something like that. Like this, this is more about more serious stuff where um, there's, there's, we're talking about neglect. We're talking about mistreatment. Um, Examples like people, for example, leaving just like things you would do wouldn't do with a child. You wouldn't leave a, a, you know animals in a, in an unheated car or an air conditioned car, a, a location or something like that, and intentional cruelty. So, what? Um, how can I say this? I'm, I'm curious about what you've seen, for example, in the past and today, and has the problem gotten worse? So I wouldn't say that the problem has gotten worse. I think that more people are now aware of these issues and doing something about these issues. Unfortunately, we don't have a good way to track these type, types of cases. Back in 2016, I believe, the FBI started um, tracking animal cruelty through NIBRS. They understood that there was a strong connection between animal cruelty and other forms of violence. They actually categorized um, animal cruelty into four different categories. And I really like how they categorize them. And I like to think about them in those four categories. And those are severe neglect and abandonment. Second is physical abuse or non-accidental injury, which is the term we've taken from the child abuse um, realm. And then there's also sexual abuse and organized abuse. And with organized abuse, that's dog fighting, cock fighting, things of those nature, what people would refer to as blood sports. Okay. Um, and so with, for example, like the pandemic and stuff like that, like, and again, I'm not all that up on the, like what's sort of happened, but I did hear, for example, you know, a lot of people were adopting animals and then now that things are back, you know, to normal, like, you know, they're, they're, they're not able to care for them properly and they're like giving them back. But I'm just wondering, you know, is there a relationship between, you know, maybe like mental health issues and stuff and then the animal treatment as well? There's definitely a strong connection with some of the neglect cases that we see with mental health. Um, hoarding, for example, is a recognized mental health condition. And we will see folks who hoard animals instead of items, they'll, they'll collect animals. And when they have hundreds of animals, it's impossible for one single person to care for them how they, they need to be cared for. So there is a strong connection there between um, large, scale cruel, large scale neglect or hoarding and, and mental health conditions. As far as the pandemic, we did see a bit of an increase um, with our caseload. We're still um, calculating all those numbers and looking at trends. So it'll be interesting over the next couple of years to see if they continue to increase or if they go down. Um, so we are tracking that, but we don't have great data right now as far as the pandemic is concerned. Okay. There's been uh, an association with you know people who are intentionally hurting animals or torturing animals with uh, leading into bigger things. And um, anyone can do a search on YouTube or, or, or whatever. Um, but there's there's a video that, that I remember seeing and it was uh, it was the uh, I think his name was Sheriff Wayne Ivory of the of the Brevard Sheriff's Office. And one of the things he says is, if you'll hurt an animal, you're going to hurt a human. And so, you know, the 
the, are you seeing things where people are doing things to animals and then potentially it starts to leading into human? Yeah, unfortunately, we do see a lot of physical abuse or non-accidental injury occurring with animals. And I think abuse in any form should be taken very seriously. Animal abuse is often found to be co-occurring with other forms of family violence, things like domestic violence, child abuse, elder abuse, and it really makes it a, a public health issue. Um, in fact, actually, the IACP, or International Association of Chiefs of Police, recently, I think at the, la the end of last year, adopted a resolution to enhance animal welfare and public safety because they recognize this important link between animal cruelty and other crimes. Um, I've also seen cases where abusers may use animals as a means to control someone. And a case that always comes to mind when I talk about this was a case years ago where um, an individual ended up calling animal services, reporting that there was a stray dog in their yard, and they reported that they appeared to have been burned which is somewhat of an odd thing to notice and to, to report. So law enforcement comes out and they scan the dog for a microchip and it has a microchip. And the owner is the person who called and reported it as a stray. Come to find out, um, we did a forensic examination. Ultimately, I saw the dog after it had died and did a forensic necropsy. And the dog looked to have been burned with um, scolding scalding hot water on multiple occasions and come to find out after being presented with that evidence, um, the person who was doing this to control the other individual did plead guilty, admitted to the fact that they had poured boiling hot water, followed by an acidic cleaning agent on this dog on multiple occasions as a mean to control that individual who called law enforcement. Okay. And thankfully, they were able to get the both and both of the people involved were able to get the help that they needed with that case. Okay, good. Um, can you talk to me about f just in general, like when you're teaching or when you're trying to explain to someone what you do, like what is what is veterinary forensics? And, yeah. you know, sort of like, why isn't it? Well, I think well, I think I know why it's important, but maybe just talk about also maybe some of how it differs from human forensics. Yeah. So basically veterinary forensic medicine is just practicing metal with medicine within a legal context so we're practicing medicine with the understanding that our findings may be used in a court of law so we have to be thorough we have to be objective um, and we have to be able to explain complex medical conditions to people without medical training a judge a jury so that they understand the evidence at hand um, it's different from human forensic pathology in the fact that our, our victims are animals. They're not people. Um, we Otherwise, it's, it's very much the same. We have clinical veterinary forensic medicine dealing with live animals. We have veterinary forensic pathology dealing with deceased animals. And just like a, a human medical doctor, we're examining those patients to gain information and evidence to present in a court of law by, by rendering our medical opinions. Okay. And um, if you were to look at your discipline over the years, I'm interested in sort of how it's evolved. Yeah. Uh, and and, and can, you, can you comment on sort of where veterinary forensics is at? Is it at the, at the same level as, you know, when we talk about forensics, you know, for, for crimes, uh, is it, is it there yet? Or is it, is it underrepresented? Um, I'm sort of interested in the differences there. Yeah. Over the last 15 years, since I've been involved, it's really grown quite rapidly. I mean, it's still very young in its evolution. We are nowhere near where human forensic medicine is, um, but we're getting there. And we learn a lot from the application of that research to our victims. And oftentimes the research for the human studies um, revolve around using, using animals. So we can apply a lot of that to our practice, um, but it's really grown by leaps and bounds. We now have a number of texts on um, 
the topic of veterinary forensic medicine, forensic pathology. We have a number of research articles, none of which existed when I started 15 years ago. I remember once I found myself in this world of veterinary forensic medicine, one, thinking I wasn't taught any of this in school, and two, who can I talk to to help me with this? And there really wasn't many people doing it back then. I reached out to the ASPCA who did have a few veterinarians who are working on this work. And I'm lucky enough now to, to be doing this for the ASPCA. And I always want to be that resource for folks who are just starting out in this area because I'm more than happy to assist them because that's that was me 15 years ago and I didn't have or know where to reach out to. So I'm more than happy to help folks who are, are starting to do this work because that's what I would have wanted and, and needed 15 years ago when I was doing this. You mentioned the ASPCA, so let, let, let me ask you about the ASPCA and, and maybe just give me a, a maybe a quick overview about the organization and its role, uh, you know, with, with what you're doing in veterinary forensics. Yeah, so the ASPCA is one of the oldest animal welfare organizations within the United States, founded in 1866. And our mission is to prevent um, and empower communities to prevent and respond to animal cruelty. Okay, and um, it is, it's a nonprofit organization. Yes. Okay, and so funding comes from donors. Yeah, yeah. okay. Yeah. And all the work that we are able to do and the services that we provide to law enforcement at no cost is because of the gifts from, from our donors. Okay, now I know, I think in Canada, we have an SPCA and I think there's, uh, and globally, like are there very many uh, similar type of organizations? Yes, oftentimes people confuse us with their local SPCAs, but the ASPCA is a national organization that is separate from the local ASPCAs that you see around the country. Okay, and, and globally, like are there, uh, what would you say is perhaps like the next largest organization that's similar to what you're, you know, what a, the ASPA is, ASPCA yeah. is. Yeah, HSUS is another organization that not only works within the U.S., but globally as well or internationally. Um, there's the, I know in um, the U.K., there's a large, and the name is escaping me now, um, organization that's very similar to ASPCA and HSUS. Okay, and also, um, I should say that uh, in, I think it was in somewhere around 2020, you're, you're in a, it's a veterinary forensic science center. So this is like a new thing for you. So where were you before and, and when did you move into Yeah, so prior to our facility, I had an office at the University of Florida. Um, and as you know, on campus, there's usually very limited space and we just very quickly outgrew that space. And we were lucky enough in 2020, right before the pandemic hit, <laughs> move into our new lab here in Florida. So we have office space as well as two large laboratory spaces. We have our necropsy suite with a radiology suite built right off of that. We have our um, osteo lab, which is right next to necropsy. So we are able to do so much here at our facility to support law enforcement throughout the country with investigating crimes against animals. Oh, and so you're, you're starting to talk about a little bit of tech, which is exactly where I wanted to go. <laughs> so um, I wanted to ask you again about like, sort of if we go back 10, 15, 20 years, what kinds of technologies were you using back then versus what you have access to today? And you know, is it a lot easier today versus back then? Like what kind of differences are there? Yeah, so when I first started, I basically had my stethoscope, my hands and a point and shoot camera. And that was what I was equipped with for a number of years. And not to say that you can't do it with just that, but now I am lucky enough to have all kinds of equipment that we utilize um, when investigating or assisting law enforcement in investigating these crimes. So when we're on scene, we'll use things like ammonia readers when we're in a hoarding house and need to measure the amount of ammonia that those animals are being exposed to on a, a routine basis. Um, we have a FLIR or thermal imaging camera to assist us. We're also starting to use now UV and IR photography with our necropsies and 
with some of our live animal exams. Like I said, we have access to the radiographs or x-rays. Um, we can also do full body CTs through a partnership with a local clinic. So we're able to do a lot um, to move these cases forward now. What does a typical day look like for you? So, you know, you're, you're there and it's probably non-typical. I expect it's non-typical, but um, I'm just wondering, like, how how does the work come in? Um, and then, you know, what is being requested of you and what kinds of activities do you typically do during the week? Yeah, it's very atypical. Um, every week is unique and exciting because we don't really know what we're going to be doing until we're doing it. So we may have a week where we're teaching. I teach a semester long course, currently teaching right now for Florida International University for the semester. Um, in two weeks, I teach a two week elective for the University of Florida for third year vet students for the College of Veterinary Medicine. So we could be teaching, doing labs, working hands on with students. Um, we could be doing casework. We might may receive um, an animal here at our facility for necropsy um, from anywhere in the country. Folks will email us and request that assistance. Those cases are vetted through our legal team and once accepted, they are, are shipped here and we will perform that necropsy. Oftentimes we have students as well as visiting veterinarians at our facility who are learning and watching while we're doing these necropsies. And then we could be deployed on a case. So we might have a few days notice, we might have a week or two's notice, and we will deploy wherever in the country to assist law enforcement with typically large scale removals of animals, processing the crime scenes, conducting uh, forensic examinations on the animals that were removed from that property. And it may be at a temporary shelter that we set up within that state, or it could be at our cruelty recovery center in Ohio, where we take the animals and conduct examinations there. And then in between all of that and our free time, we're conducting research. So there's so much research and so many questions that we've had come up through our casework, through doing it, through testimony that we want to have the answers to. So in all of our free time, we are uh, conducting research in this area. Yeah, I, I can, I mean, you know, with humans, at least it's one species, but, you yeah. know, when you're talking about dogs, cats, horses, um, just, I, you know, I, I, yeah, I can only imagine the differences there and the lack of research as well, like the very specific things that are, you know, particular to, you know, a dog versus a horse or something like that. So um, what are what are the most, what, which are the animals that you see the most? Like what, what species of animals are the most typical? And, and I'd like to know what is the most atypical or the most rare one that you've seen? Yeah, so we tend to see mostly canines, dogs. Um, we occasionally also have cases, large scale cases with chickens, cats, horses, farm animal, other farm animals. Um, occasionally we'll have exotic animals. Um, I've had maybe a handful of times a clouded uh, dragon or yeah, clouded dragon that we were working with um, snakes, reptiles, um, other small like pocket pets, mammals, small mammals that will come across occasionally. And, and in those cases, we'll find uh, veterinarians in the area who kind of specialize in, in those species to provide us with assistance. But typically, okay. typically, it's dogs, cats, horses, chickens. Okay. And so um, what other notable universities or organizations are there that are doing research as well in, in this area? Yeah, there are a few universities who are doing research in this area as well as offering classwork in this area. University of Florida. Um, conducts research in this area, University of Georgia, LSU. Um, I'm sure there's, oh, Michigan State also does some research in this area. So there's more and more veterinary schools who are starting to become engaged in, in this area of study and in, in this area of, of education. 
Okay. I'm looking at uh, like some of the research that you've already done and some of the stuff that you've published. And so I always find it interesting because over time, like there's sometimes people have like an evolution or there's a specific path that they're following. But some of the research that you're doing are or some of the things that you've written about are about, you know, veterinary needs for animal cruelty recognition, uh, things like best practices, um, you know, influence of evidence on animal cruelty, like these kinds of studies. And so that tells me, or at least to me, it's a hint that um, you're still at a, a pretty early stage in this discipline, like, and that there's a lot of work ahead of you. Is, is, it, would that, is that fair to say? Yeah, I think that's fair to say. There's a lot that we just don't know. Nobody has researched it, published it. There's just, there's a lot. Okay. And I mean, you're part of the OSAC committee too. And so I'm wondering how do you, how do you fit in or how do you play in with, you know, the, the people that are talking about, you know, uh, crime scenes, uh, you know, typical crime scenes and things like that, that, you know, we see on TV and everything else. And how do you fit in? And I mean, is it, you know, pretty much the same thing? The investigative methods are the same. Like, I'm curious about investigating these kinds of things. They're different. I mean, you don't, you, you never have a witness because, you know, witnesses can't dial 911 and, and, you know, these you know, dogs, cats or whatever. So I'm curious about the differences there. Yeah. So they are very similar. When I first started on the OSAC committee back in, I believe it was 2019, at first people are like, why is there a veterinarian here? This makes no sense. But the more I listen to the conversations, we process these crime scenes the same way. Our crime scene analysts who process these scenes come to us from 20, 15 years experience on human crime scenes, and they apply that knowledge to the animal crime scenes. There are some differences. A big one that you pointed out is that our victims are not humans, they're animals. Oftentimes law enforcement doesn't recognize that the animals themselves well are also the victim are also the evidence in these cases. So if they come across a deceased animal in the trash, they may just leave it there or dispose of it and think nothing of it. And that's the evidence in that case. We need that to do a thorough necropsy and understand what may or may not have happened to that, that individual. Um, so I think the training is essential to assist law enforcement in understanding that these cases, while a little bit different, are very much the same and to treat them like any other crime they would be investigating, process the scene the same way, and just think about the different types of evidence that you will see in these cases. Um, so the animal is a piece of evidence. You wanna document that animal's living environment. And then there's also specific things, let's say with um, dog fighting that we see on those scenes time and time again, and being able to recognize those pieces of evidence and how they apply to that type of crime. Okay. I, I was going to just ask you about the dog fighting because you have a few um, research uh, publications with respect to dog fighting. And I was wondering if it's because it's something that you're seeing very frequently. Is it a big problem in the United States? It is a huge problem. I had no idea when I was in private practice and vet school, no idea how common and how pervasive really dog fighting is throughout the United States. Um, any given Saturday night, there is a number of dog fights occurring all over the country. And we could probably do a dog fighting case every week and still make very little strides in um, eliminating that practice. It is, it's extremely pervasive and it's really disturbing to know uh, that that's still occurring and on such high levels throughout the United States. I did or participated in a case, I think it was back in 2013. It was the second largest dog fan case in U.S. history, second to the Missouri 500. So we had just under um, 500 dogs that were seized. And to sit in court and to hear um, dog fighters testify against other dog fighters and just describe the lengths and the extent to which they were going to participate this, traveling across the country, up and down the coast, bidding hundreds of thousands of dollars on these cases, as much as half a million dollars on a single fight, is just it blows your mind to know that that this is still occurring and it's just it's so driven underground that it's it's hard to find and to detect and investigate 
So it's it's funny though because if it's if it's it must be well organized or at a high level because uh, if if it's that rampant, uh, then you know people must either find ways to get around it or whatever. But um, you know, I, like where do they host these things? They must be remote or in in places that are far far away. Yeah, they and they often change the location at the last minute to um, deter uh, detection by law enforcement. So oftentimes with these cases, if they are investigating a, a fight or going in on a fight that's happening as they're going in, they oftentimes have um, an undercover agent who, who knows exactly where it's going to be. Otherwise, it's, it's very difficult to um, intercept them as they're happening because they're so hidden. Okay. I have to ask you about one of your studies because I do not know what this is, but it's, it's Babesia gibsoni. What the heck is yes. that? It's an infection. Yes. <laughs> so it is a protozoal uh, infection that attacks the, the red blood cell of typically pit bull type dogs. And the reason why we were look or dogs were bit by pit bulls. And the reason why, why we wanted to look at that was because we were seeing it more and more in our organized dog fighting cases. And early on, we weren't detecting it because they're not all labs test for all the different species of Babesia. And so we were missing dogs that were clinical, but on the lab results, it looked like they didn't have it. But then we found uh, a more comprehensive panel where we send them now and we, we detect it quite frequently in these guys. As much as 26% um, of a typical dog fighting population is affected by Babesia gypsoni, as opposed to about 2% within the general pit bull population. So no known association with organized dog fighting. So it's another piece of the puzzle to assist us in recognizing organized dog fighting. Yeah. So, and with respect to dog fighting and the injuries, I mean, is there a way to distinguish between, you know, what is a dog fight versus what is just, you know, a, it's always a dog fight. If a dog gets into a fight, it's still a dog fight. It's just, it wasn't a planned event kind of thing. So, I mean, how do you, how that must be super difficult to distinguish. Um, so but are, are you looking at things like that? Yes. Yes. We have done a few studies and I'm actually currently looking at this even further and hope, hope to publish by the end of this year an ongoing study. But we had a study, it was back in, oh, what year was it? 20, maybe it was 2019, I think, that was published in JAGMA, which is the Journal of the American Veterinary Medical Association, looking at just that, differentiating between a spontaneous dog fight, meaning to housemates that get into it over food or a toy or attention versus an organized dog fighting case. So dogs who have been bred, trained to fight in an organized fashion. And we saw a distinct difference between these groups of dogs. With the organized dog fighting, we see not only a difference in the distribution, but the amount of wounds and scars. So it's mostly a, a head, head or front aspect of the animal distribution. So primarily the front legs, followed by the lateral aspect and dorsal aspect of the head, followed by the muzzle and the oral mucosa. So mostly the front of the animal, as opposed to the spontaneous dog fights where we see them primarily targeting the ears, followed by the neck, followed by the front legs, but that is much fewer, just a handful of injuries in those areas. And with the organized dog fighting, we are seeing dozens of injuries to those areas. Um, a second study that we did looking at um, not only the distribution of injuries, but also inner dog aggression with dogs seized from organized dog fighting cases, we saw about 36.5 um, injuries per dog fighting dog. So it's a lot more than just a handful of, of injuries like we see with the spontaneous dog fights. I want to ask you about law enforcement and their knowledge of what you guys are doing. And I, I imagine, you know, you must, you have a good campaign, you're very well known and stuff like that, but do you still find that you have to educate people on how to, you know, hey, we're here, like we can help. Uh, like, are you finding that there's still more work to be done in that regard? 
Yes, very much so. We are constantly doing trainings um, throughout the United States and we always hear, oh, I wish we would have known that or we had a case like this. Does that you know, sound familiar? So there's, there's a lot of education to be done in this area. Um, just in recognizing the different crime types and the different evidence associated with, with these cases. So in your training, so you offer training for like seminars and things like that, I guess, for police, for law enforcement to say, hey, look, you know, if you're in this kind of situation, you know, here's what you look for. Um, are there are there any things you would recommend or uh, sort of what are some of the important factors when, let's say, for example, maybe it's not law enforcement, but somebody, a person suspects mm -hmm. something of happening? Yep. So I always think of the, the slogan in New York City, if you see something, say something. So if you suspect that there may be something going on with an animal in your neighborhood, or if you see something, you need to report that to local law enforcement or to animal control. Um, same thing with veterinarians in private practice. If they suspect animal cruelty, they should be reporting those suspicions to law enforcement. Um, there is more information available to not only veterinarians, but to citizens as well if they have concerns on our website. If they go to ASPCA.org backslash cruelty or slash cruelty, um, that's a great resource for where to go if you suspect animal cruelty may be occurring. Okay. Um, and actually, uh, to that effect, you have uh, there, there's a special website which is the ASPCA Pro, right? So can can you tell me the difference between the ASPCA and the ASPCA Pro? And I'll bring it up here as well. Yeah. So ASPCA Pro is for working professionals, so those in the animal welfare field, law enforcement, veterinarians. Um, <clears throat> we direct them to ASPCA Pro for. Uh, resources to assist them in doing this work, whereas um, ASPCA.org is for um, for private citizens to learn more. Okay, and they can they can reach out to you and, and get involved that way as well, right? Exactly. Okay, um, I wanted to ask about the. I mean, when you're doing examinations, you'll have sometimes you'll have a living animal. Sometimes you could have an animal that's that's dead or sometimes I'm wondering, do you get any cases where you're just looking at bones uh, yeah. or, or something that's far gone, you know, something that's, that's, yeah. Uh, can Often you tell me about that? Yes, we do have cases where animals are severely decomposed and all we can do in those scenarios is a skeletal analysis. Um, we do have one of our crime scene analysts is almost done with a PhD in forensic anthropology. And so she will macerate or remove the tissues from those remains and um, works with forensic anthropologists to um, assess those skeletal remains. And we've had some really amazing outcomes in those types of cases. We had one case where it was um, a dog fighting case we were present on scene when law enforcement served the warrant. There was a grave that was detected and we excavated the remains of a single canine. The dog was extremely decomposed. It, it was a very hot summer. Um, I took a look at what I could with the soft tissue um, and I did find one bullet that was lodged in, or projectile that was lodged in the throat did x-rays. And after that, I handed it over to Amanda to, to macerate it. And she removed all the tissue and painstakingly glued the mandible or the lower jaw back together. And lo and behold, we did not have one gunshot wound. We had two gunshot wounds. And she was able to determine based on the fracture pattern that the one to the throat occurred prior to the one to the head, which would have instantly killed the animal. So that opened the door for an additional animal cruelty charge, which later the defendant did plead guilty to. So we couldn't say how much time was between those two shots, but it opened the door for immense pain and suffering to have occurred. I've noticed that because a lot of a lot of people that are that are doing you know the cruelty and stuff like that, they often record like what's what's going on so they'll they'll take their cell phones or or and they'll record this stuff and then they'll post it online i don't know what they're thinking but um 
do you ever have to do any work where you have to try and identify the animal in the video versus the, you know, the body that's been recovered? Occasionally, we'll, we will have requests like that. Um, more commonly, we get, especially in the city, um, video surveillance, and we're asked to um, break down that videotape of what exactly is occurring to that animal. We may even have our behaviorists break it down from a behavioral standpoint of the mental um, suffering that may have been occurring in, in those cases. I see, okay. Um, and um, I'm curious about um, maybe some rare cases that you've had or maybe some things where, you, where you've had like these oh wow moments like geez I you know never never thought about that before are there any of those that stick out in your mind over your career yeah a big one was um, a cow case that I worked on um, so there were two cows that were killed within a, a field full of cows um, the farmer called law enforcement and they weren't able because of the size of these animals they weren't able to transport much what i was presented with was the head and two hind legs of a cow and i thought there was no way i was going to be able to do much but i always say it's worth a look you never know until you take a look what you what you might find and at that time i was doing my necropsies in a lab with a bunch of forensic anthropologists and I was looking at the head in particular and the hind legs. And one of the anthropologists noted over my head, because they were always really interested. I was interested in their cases. They were really interested in mine. My own, mine always smelled a lot more than theirs did. <laughs> so it always drew maybe some bad attention that way. But the anthropologist leaned over my shoulder and she was like, oh, I recognize those, those saw marks. So the body had been cut apart and they said it looks like a reciprocating saw created those marks and i was like how do you know that well unfortunately they do because people may mm -hmm. occasionally cut other people up so i was able to macerate that and i gave her the bone she looked under a microscope did her analyses and was able to say yes it was a reciprocating saw and that blew that case wide open so with that information law enforcement went back served a second warrant at because they had a good idea of who the suspect may be but they found nothing the first time they searched the property found a reciprocating saw brought that saw back to our office we took it apart swabbed it did find some traces of what looked to be blood swabbed it i took muscle from the cow submitted it for dna analysis and it was a perfect match Oh, cool. So with that information, that defendant decided to plead guilty to the killing of the two cows, which in that state is a felony offense. So it was it was just amazing to me, though, how all of these um, specialists can come together to really solve these cases. I had no idea just how um, multidisciplinary these cases were until I started working with, with all these different forensic specialists. It's really so, amazing. So what is your team like then? Like how, what, what is the makeup of your team? And then like, do you have partnerships or relationships with people outside that are like on contract or something, or you just, you call out whoever, like how, how, how what's your, what's your team like? Yep. So we have the four veterinarians and then two crime scene analysts and a veterinary technician. But we often will work with a boarded veterinary radiologists routinely submitting our radiographs to um, veterinarian, vet, veterinary radiologists who specializes in, in forensics. Um, we work with pathologists, veterinary pathologists, when we're doing our necropsies. Um, we work with um, entomologists, with um, a variety of, of specialists within the veterinary forensic or within the forensic field, not veterinary forensic, just forensic sciences. Um, but also our crime scene analysts have um, experience with like blood spatter analysis and that will come in handy with um, the blood sport cases. Yeah, that makes sense. And your relationship with the universities in Florida, can you talk a little bit regarding that? And I mean, there, there's people here who are, you know, students and they may be looking at, you know, a career at some point uh, in, in this particular area. And I'm just wondering, um, 
what is the pathway like and what are some of the options for them to get into this field? Yeah. So there are a few options now. Um, there is a master's degree program as well as a certificate program that the ASPCA assisted the University of Florida in uh, developing and setting up. Um, so the University of Florida has now taken that and, and run with that. So that's an ongoing pro uh, program that or degree program that they offer. We're also working closely with Florida International University to ve develop another, um, a second degree program. And this is going to be a PSM or professional science master's degree in veterinary forensics. And this will be launching in the fall of this year. So another degree program to be looking at. And this one is um, very much a forensic science-based program, but targeting more um, those working in veterinary medicine, maybe technicians, veterinarians, front desk staff. Um, and then we're hopeful that we will be able to develop a, a second track that will be directed towards law enforcement. So a more investigative track in the future with that program. There, there was a text that we uh, we had chatted about. Let me just see if I can, if I have my notes here. Is it uh, Jason Brooks? Yes, uh, veterinary uh, forensic pathology uh, text. Right, right. So that's that's something that you contributed some chapters to, right? I did. I did. I think I wrote three chapters in, in that. Okay, and is that that's sort of the is that sort of a uh, the Bible or kind of thing kind of book that people oh, there's use? A num there's a number of resources, but that is my go to uh, resource, and that's the resource I use for the courses that I teach. But there are a number of of different texts on the topic now. Okay, um, let me ask you about what you have planned in the future. Um, are you looking at growing the department? Are is there sp are specific areas of research? Um, of interest to you that you want to focus in on, uh, you know, partnerships, like whatever, like what, what's sort of happening right now and looking forward, like what's going on? Yeah, so we want to continue to spread the word to law enforcement, as well as veterinarians and others working in this field, that we are a resource for them. Uh, we offer necropsies, we can deploy on scene and assist with large scale removals and investigations. So I want law enforcement to know that, that we're a resource for them and that we are able to do that at, at no cost to them. Um, we are continuing to teach. We hold trainings throughout the year for law enforcement, for veterinarians, those in the animal welfare profession, and we continue to do the research. Um, I think areas of research for me in particular is is dog fighting. I have I have an interest in that area, and there's a lot of questions that I have that I I want answers to. So we'll continue to investigate that area, as well as investigating how we can better serve veterinarians. What what do veterinarians need? What does law enforcement need? What does what do prosecutors need to assist them in investigating and prosecuting these cases? Um, because again, it's it's a novel, a fairly young profession, and, and there's a lot of questions that that we need to answer, um, and that we need to have answers to in court to help us um, make these cases and to determine what has or has not occurred. I think it's just as important to rule in as it is to rule out these cases. I've had plenty of cases where uh, law enforcement was quick to um, determined that an animal had been mutilated when in fact it, it wasn't a human that mutilated that animal. It, that animal was attacked by another animal. So it's just as important to rule out animal cruelty as it is to rule it in because we don't want anyone who has not committed one of these crimes to be prosecuted for those crimes. So there's a lot of research to be done all around in helping to identify um, when cruelty has not and has not occurred. Oh, interesting. Yeah, if there's any, uh, that, that's an interesting one, because I know that there's, like, for example, uh, where I teach at the University of Toronto, uh, anthropology is big there. So um, that is the area where, you know, people focus in on, is it a cut mark, or, you know, a knife tool mm -hmm. mark, or is it, like you said, a, you know, reciprocating saw or something else, yeah. right? So uh, if there's any areas uh, in particular that you need help with, you maybe just mention it here, because there's probably going to be a few people that are going to listen, um, you know, if there needs to be work in a particular area. So, 
Yeah, um, or even I've looked at different human studies looking at um, different tools to cut hair and how that looks different microscopically. And we haven't really um, done work like that with, with our animal victims, but there's just so much crossover and so much we can learn and apply from the human side to the animal side. Yeah, it's just amazing. Like again, I'm just thinking about all the reptiles and the all the different things that you're working on. So I I don't know how you keep track. It's hard enough when it's just you know one species, but when you have all this crossover, uh, you really have to be super knowledgeable in all these areas. So I think that's a credit to to the, the work that you're doing. Um, could, would it be okay if I bring up your um, your LinkedIn profile? Because I'd like to get uh, in case somebody has some information here. Let me just. Sure. Uh, Okay, so yeah, it's rich. Let me see if I can make that larger. Um, also, the there's an email that uh, people can, uh, and I believe this is for law enforcement uh, or people if they have questions or they want to get in touch. Um, let me bring that up here, and and so just just so I'm clear and I'm not misspeaking, but what's the purpose of this email or who should be contacting you here? Yeah, so this is how you contact our laboratory here in Florida. Um, it's the ASPCA Veterinary Forensic Science Center, so AVFSC at ASPCA.org. If law enforcement has questions, they want to maybe submit a case to us, they can email us through that. Veterinarians, if they have questions, want to consult on a case, they can email us that way. Um, we're here as a resource and, and we're happy to do whatever we can. And if we're not the right folks, we're happy to direct people where they need to go. Okay. And somebody had asked a question about the text and I don't know if you can just respond again. What was the, was the actual title of the, the, the text uh, with Jason Brooks? Yes, it's veterinary forensic pathology and there's two volumes, volume one and volume two. Okay. So, uh, Gail, I hope that helps you out there. So, all right, great. Well, look, um, I think that's most of what I want to cover. I think it's, uh, again, very appreciative of your time and for being here. I'm really glad that we could uh, bring some visibility to this and, and hopefully maybe in the future, uh, I'd like to have you back, maybe talking about more specific cases and more of the technology and, and a lot of the stuff that you're working on. Uh, I think it's great work. I think it's super cool. You got a cool, a new uh, forensic center that you can work out of instead of the, uh, the university uh, lab. And, and it's great that people are uh, bringing awareness to this and uh, you know that that uh, it's growing for you as well. So best of luck there. Great, thank you so much for having us. Yeah, absolutely, my pleasure. All right, uh, hey, hang back, and then I'll I'll come back to you in just a little bit. Sounds good. All right, thanks. Okay, folks, that does it for uh, this particular one. A, a very important topic, um, you know, something that I've been wanting to uh, talk about for some time now. So really appreciative that uh, we could have uh, have Rachel here to discuss this important topic. Uh, we're going to be back soon with another episode. Don't forget that this will be on uh, podcast uh, pretty soon. So make sure that you look out for it there. Uh, I want to thank everybody for their time. And today was a Wednesday instead of a Thursday. It's a little bit different, but no big deal. Uh, we're going to try our best to get back to Thursdays, but nonetheless, look for more uh, soon. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.